members of the fourth estate, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I am very delighted to have opportunity to talk to the fourth estate today over issues that are affecting our country and the region in general. So let me thank the leadership and members of the International Press Association of East Africa, IPEA, for honoring our request to meet today and exchange views. We meet at a time of great fluidity in Kenya and much of the region. From your incisive reporting, which we very much appreciate, it is clear you are in touch with the developments in our country and the region. I am here today to speak to you about the ongoing tax protest in Kenya, which will continue. We will also talk about a problem we never anticipated the unprecedented horrors of police brutality against the protesters. With the constitutional guarantee for protests, we never imagined that police would outlaw protests, confront protesters, and kill so many as is the case now. We never expected the state-sponsored genocide that is taking place. My intention, therefore, is to jumpstart a candid discussion about this development, share our fears and perspectives, and listen to yours too. The most important discussion in our country today is the high taxes, rising cost of living, and the ensuing protests. Although the tax protests had been initiated by Azimio, it has since gone beyond the party. After the passage of the Finance Act, Kenyans have defied party, political and regional divides, and united to resist punitive taxation and demand the lowering of the cost of basic commodities. But the tax burden is unbearable. It's no longer a party issue. It is a Kenyan issue. The purpose by the state, sorry, the response by the state to the protests has given way to something that now looks like even more ominous than the high cost of living that the protests were initially about. We are witnessing unprecedented police brutality. We are also witnessing an unprecedented phenomenon of the state resorting to armed militia to quell protests. You have visited hospitals and morgues, and you have established that police and hired gangs have shot and killed or wounded scores of people at close range. Some have been shot from the back as they fled or in a position of surrender. The shots have been aimed at the vital organs and the delicate parts of the victims, like the stomach, the spine, the heart, the chest, and the head. All the victims have been unarmed. Underscore the word unarmed. These protests were about the cost of living and excessive taxation, and they will continue as such. But we are now forced to deal with the question of policing, policing in a supposedly democratic state like Kenya. Police being deployed to break the protests have failed to act in accordance with the constitution and the law. First, there is no legal backing for police breaking up protests. The protests are protected by Section 37 of the Constitution. We are left wondering whether the Constitution has been suspended or the Constitution itself is a lie. 
even if we were to assume that police have a right to break up protests, which they don't have, there is no justification whatsoever for the use of live bullets against unarmed civilians. If the aim is to break up protests, then what is the justification for police to pull people out of their homes and shoot or clobber and kill them as is happening in parts of the country, particularly in Kisumu and the slums of Nairobi? When police follow you into your house and start clobbering or shooting, what are you supposed to do? We expect security forces to carry out their duties and responsibilities with a complete impartiality and without regard to ethnicity, political persuasion, or other partisan considerations. In these protests, the police are partisan. They have ethnic formations and they are pursuing an ethnic agenda. That is why we believe we are in the formative stages of, a, of a genocide and political persecution sanctioned by the state like happened to the Jews in Germany. The deployment of the police officers in parts of the country, including Nairobi, depicts a determination by, by the state to perpetuate ethnic cleansing. Going back to the Finance Act and the wider question of high taxes, the question we are struggling with as a nation is, what are the citizens supposed to do when the government ignores their feelings, views and circumstances? In the run-up to the vote on what is now the Finance Act, polls showed that more than 90% of Kenyans rejected it. Even after MPs voted in favor of the act, polls still showed that the majority of Kenyans did not like it. But the executive proceeded and imposed punitive taxes. We are aware that the rising cost of living is not limited to Kenya. We also know the country has debts to pay. But we know no country that responded to high cost of living by raising taxes the way Kenya did. Nearly all other countries embrace policies that ease the pain. Kenya embraced policies that worsen the pain. And I'm talking to you as somebody who has run the government. The government had the option to request for debt relief in the form of highly concessional rescheduling of external and domestic public debt, including the debt owed to China. Kenya could have pursued comparable treatment of commercial debt. It chose to burden citizens with the taxes. What are citizens supposed to do in such circumstances? In Kenya, we, we long embraced the idea that in a democracy, few individuals cannot use government as their tool against the people. In the case of the Finance Act, the people were ignored. What are the people supposed to do? Some have argued that some have argued that we should have stopped the, pro the proposals during the vote in Parliament. But we could not. One of the first steps this regime embarked on upon coming to office was to lure some of our MPs to his side to give itself an, an artificial majority. Those MPs teamed up with the executive to defeat the wishes of the people. For record, you need to know that at the elections, Azimir Coalition won 172 seats against Kenya Kwanzaa's 165. So we had a majority of seven members of parliament. But the situation has since changed, which is why 
protection and respect for the independence and autonomy of political parties in the spirit of multi-party democracy is also a core issue we are prosecuting against this regime. And you know, for record, in the USA, the Republicans have a majority in uh, the, the Senate. And that majority will remain until the life of that parliament. If the regime did not leave our MPs to his side, and if it stopped interfering with the affairs of our constituent parties, the Unpopular Finance Act would have been rejected. The executive uh, uh, would have been forced to negotiate. We therefore resorted to the timeless principle that in a, demo a democratic country that is founded upon the sovereign, uh, sovereignty of the people, wherever, whenever the arms of government, whether the executive or the legislature or judiciary, fall into the hands of men and women who use, who use their delegated sovereign power to oppress the people and benefit themselves, then it becomes a right and a duty of the people in pursuit of the common good and to assert their sovereignty to disobey those men and women and their laws. But when we took refuge in Article 37 of our Constitution, which gives every person the right, peaceably and unarmed, to assemble, to demonstrate, to picket, and to present petitions to public authorities. Unfortunately, that is what the police are killing people for. People are being arrested in the most uncivil way. Many have been abducted commando style and held in communicado way past the stipulated period of 24 hours within which they must be presented in court. Both police and hired goons are trailing, arresting, and shooting people from unmarked vehicles and those with foreign number plates, raising the question of whether these are police, police or thugs. Police have also taken over the corridors of justice in our courts. They have attacked families of people seeking justice in court. Honorable Babu Owino was abducted and ferried away from court corridors to being released on bail. Police have attacked journalists and chased them from the court corridors. Protesters, including Azimio leaders, are being put under house arrest and constant surveillance and persistent threat of being arrested. If leaders, including myself, have committed a crime, the state should issue arrest warrants or ask them to present themselves to a police station. In this regard, we very much appreciate the UN Human Rights Office for calling out the Kenya police for failing to facilitate peaceful assemblies and failing the test of legality, necessity, proportionality, and non-discrimination in the use of force. Firearms should never be used to disperse protests, but police are doing so here. Which is why we are currently assembling more evidence, which we will shortly present to the International Criminal Court with an appeal to the court to open a file on state-sanctioned police atrocities in Kenya. We have also seen constant verbal attacks on President Uhuru Kenyatta, the fourth president of the Republic of Kenya, with the withdrawal of security of his mother, Mamangina Kenyatta, the attack on his son, Jomo, by an uniformed people claiming to be police and the attack and vandalization of the Kenyatta family Northland farms and also the company of yours truly. These developments are alien to this country. As a country, we adopted an unwritten rule that for the sake of stability and dignity of our nation, we shall as much as possible 
let the retired president live in peace. We let President Moy and President Kibaki in peace. We appreciate the good they did and, they, and learn from their mistakes. This is pretty much the case in virtually all countries unless a retired president is actively involved in undermining the state. The developments here are therefore very worrying. I fear for my country. I have lived in a dictatorship before. I fear a new dictatorship is taking roots here and our work is cut out for us. We therefore see this is a time of great fluidity for Kenya and the region. If Kenya goes off the rails, it will take down with its huge chunks of the East African community, the Horn, and the Great Lakes region. We feel it is important to keep the world well informed of these developments. We need the understanding of the world in our endeavors to ensure a peaceful and prosperous future in this region. We have long prided ourselves as the buffer for democracy, the anchor state, and the biggest economy in this region. These features are under serious threat. Because of high taxes, weak currency, high cost of power, corruption, and nepotism, investors are fleeing and our currency is forever falling. Ethnic division and tensions are building up, especially after the regime declared that the country is a company limited by shares, pegged on how one voted. That policy is actually being implemented, which is why only one ethnic community is being hired to strategic positions in the public service. That's why we are pro prosecuting the need for inclusivity. As things stand, I fear we are marching down a very slippery path. Even on matters in which we were absolutely clear and we were seen to be providing leadership, we are beginning to fumble and send mixed signals. Take the case of climate change. Kenya has been a clear leader here, investing in clean green growth and raising forest cover. Now the country is busy clearing its forests, while at the same time hosting climate change negotiations and accusing the international community of failing to provide funds to mitigate climate change. On matters of critical significance to global community like the climate change, food security, and Russia-Ukraine war, we have become entirely transactional. No ideology, no policy, just transactions. As a country, we are paying a steep price for the Russia-Ukraine war. When Russia invaded Ukraine, Kenya took a principal stand at the UN that won international applause. We supported multilateralism against unilateralism. We rejected expansionist tendencies and the use of force in settling disputes. We also rejected any new forms of domination and oppression. That clarity no longer exists. Today, we act with little regard for multilateralism and global opinion. We are in Belarus, Russia, Iran, and the Middle East. That is hardly a way to run a country. We know where all these knee-jerk reactions and the reincarnation of dictatorship is coming from. We have a regime that suffers a legitimacy deficit. We believe the current administration rigged itself into power and does not enjoy popular mandate. To put this matter to, of legitimacy to test, to rest, we have been pushing for the complete audit 
of the 2022 elections. As a party, we believe the machinations that sneaks Kenya Kwanza into power are the reason behind the regime's determination to single-handedly reconstitute the Independent Electoral Boundaries Commission, IBC, an attempt we are vehemently opposed to. We believe that in the absence of a professional audit of the 2022 elections and a bipartisan reconstitution of the IBC, the results of the 2027 elections is a foregone conclusion. This is the struggle we are currently engaged in as a party. This is the struggle we wish the world to understand us clearly on. We believe Kenya is on a wrong path and that that could impact many countries in the region and lead to a major instability. As patriots, we are doing our best to stop the slide. I welcome questions and comments. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.